like to start with a couple of metaphors. And actually, I think one of these is just to be smart about it is probably a meta metaphor, but we'll move on from that. Um, and you can see where I'm general theme is here, looking at the metaphorical. Start with Esya. This is Esya. Um, or is it? Or more correctly, the question I want to ask is, which Esya are we looking at here? The reason I'm framing this question in that way, I hope will become clear as I proceed. To start with, and it's, yeah, it's, it's foggy, it's cold, so it's, that's a reasonably good picture despite look better in the darkened room. Um, there is a mountain range just across the water from um, Reykjavik, known as Esja. Its peak rises to about 900 metres. It's locally known as Esjan, with the suffix definite article. Um, and I, it gives the, the, the Esja gives a nice linguistic and textual certainty and a kind of colloquial emphasis on proximity and familiarity. And from the point of view of your average Reykjavik Inger, Esjan dominates a northerly view from the city from where, it sits on the, where the city sits on the southern side of the bay. And anyone who's been there will recognise this scene. Um, now, I've got a few of these pictures, but I'm going to jump forward. My PowerPoint, still not perfect. Um, Esther also appears in the Kalmasinga saga. And I'll jump forward one. Um, oh, what does it? This is the question again. This is a curious post classical Islandinga saga, the manuscript of which dates from the 15th century. It's the only saga that concerns itself specifically with the region around the Icelandic capital, Kalanes. Sorry, capital, full stop. Kalanes is a headland of the low-lying farmland underneath Estia, jutting into the bay. And the name of the bay is, well, backwards. That's the one I want there. Huh. So here we have Kalanes, Estia over here, and Paxaflori is the bay which is named this bead from there. Um, now both Kalanes and Paxaflori are clearly mentioned in Kalmasinga saga. But the Asia we have in the saga is not the actual mountain range. In fact, the mountain range is not even mentioned, not once. Instead, Asia in Kalmasinga saga is a character. She's a settler, an outsider, a wealthy and authoritative Hebridean woman. She's not comfortably socialised within the Icelandic settlement narrative. The classical East Lending Asurgur, as you are no doubt aware, will often privilege male-dominated farming landowners of Norwegian descent, although it should also be acknowledged at the outset that there are many high-status women in the sagas as well, and so Esja is not the only powerful non-Norwegian settler woman in the East Lending Asurgur. Um, I mean, we heard of Oetra deep-minded early in Black Style, and she's a good example of a powerful outside, outsider woman in the male domain. Um, the social implications of the Esja in the saga, that's the character, not the mountain, I find are really interesting. And what I'm thinking about here are questions about how we understand the roles of outsiders, how we understand the gender dynamics, how we might interpret socio-economic power structures, and how we understand the Christian pagan tensions in their narratological forms. But I, unfortunately, well, maybe fortunately, I don't know, I don't plan to explore those particular topics in this paper. Instead, I will just give a quick overview of, of what the saga contains in those respects because it forms a useful um, part or context of what I want to talk about um, in more detail later. Um, now we can leave that slide, sorry, I'm just juggling around here. So we know Esia is an outsider. It's not just in terms of where she came from. She occupies a paradoxical space in the narrative. She's both central and marginal to the society that is represented in the saga. And she also represents, in a way, a kind of inversion of the typical social order. Um, and as a result, I think she's a, quite a strong challenge to that order. Um, there is a theme of Christianisation running through the narrative. The arrival of the Hebridean settlers, in fact, the whole decision to settle where they do, and Karl Ness, um, occurs as part of a mythologised Christianisation land claiming narrative. Ezra is foster mother of the main character, Billy Andresson, who starts out as a coal beater which, as you no doubt know, is the saga narrative typology for a Kelly youth waiting by the kitchen fire for the occasion to arise um, through which he will um, become a worthy adult. And usually these characters become extremely worthy, high performance and highly troubling adults. Um, as foster mother, Esia is therefore the main enabler of his socialisation. Bowie refuses paganism and for that he is outlawed by the old order then in, in 
control in on Calidas. Asia protect, protects him. Her support for his disruptive, excuse me, <coughs> behaviour, um, I, I think can be understood as Asia being instrumental not just in his socialisation but also in his anti-socialisation. Um, his behaviours in the dealings with the rest of Calidas society at that time tend to be very socially, or quite socially disruptive, and they have a kind of heroic quality about them. And there's also a touch of, um, of what looks like probably an Irish influence in this narrative and the character which he portrays. Um, but I don't have time to go into that either. It's another paper altogether. Um, but nevertheless, Billy is constantly under Essia's protection. And while her fellow Hebrideans have all been baptised, Essia is specifically described as for Ibrutham, in old in her ways. And this appears as a basis for the power she calls upon to protect her foster son and their powers which are quite beyond the everyday norm. Curiously though, they are both mysterious, you know, perhaps magic, sorcery, that type of realm, but they're also, some of, some of the things she does and says are just very clever and very legalistic um, dealings with other power figures. Um, so that's, that's the narrated Asia in a nutshell. She's wise, she's powerful, she's resourceful, and she's very independent, she's no one's fool. She's a gendered and seriously important player in a man's world. Um, even if, you know, it's just that world is principally the narrow world of farming settlements along the shores of Faxaflowey and into Clalford, further in the, in the north. Um, but I want to leave Esther there, there for a moment in terms of the question of the semantics of place names. Um, and the range of choices the modern reader has in reading these place names in a medieval saga. In fact, what interests me most here is how a modern reader negotiates the semantics. And more fundamentally, although less simplistic, where these negotiations come from and how it is, even, how it is that we even get choices in interpreting place names. Um, what I want to talk about, no, one more, um, is what I refer to as the semiotic gap. And in this case, it's basically this. We have one name, Esha, applying to two different things. In the saga, it's a personal name. It appears in the narrative. Outside the saga, we have a place name that is applied to a known geographic landmark. The semiotic gap arises because the same name signifies both character and mountain, but not at the same time or in the same text. These two are not in the same environment, they are not in the same medium, and they are not in the same narrative. Somehow the meaning slips between the two, and the signified becomes very slippery as a result. Well, maybe, the, maybe I need to work on that metaphor a bit better. We need to think about how we deal with this variability, and our options for interpret interpreting a name which seems to be embedded both in the saga as well as in the geography. In the saga, while we don't actually have Escher the mountain range, we do have the place name Escherberg, which, translated literally, means something like Escher's cliff or Escher's rock. And that's the name of the farm where Escher lives. I actually hesitate to put this slide in up at this point because it seems like I'm implicitly foreclosing on my discussion. This is clearly the current farm Escherberg. In fact, that's the sign to it. Farm house is up here. Um, and some positivists have said, well, this is where Bowie escaped up here and his cave's no longer there because it fell down because of an earthquake and all that sort of stuff. Um, now, it's clearly the current farm, Essieberg. It's highly likely a farm named Essieberg existed somewhere here at the time of the writing of the saga, and which is you know, approximately 15th century. Um, and there's also a very good chance that a farm of this name was here sometime early in the settlement of the area. The, it is that Essieberg is also mentioned in La Nummerbock. Um, but we need to remember that there is a massive risk of walking blindly into a rookie's error here, which I think is something similar to uh, hitting an orb weaver's web when walking in the Australian bush at night. It's not fatal, it isn't even dangerous. That's a bit freaky and annoying, but mostly it shows you weren't paying attention and you weren't being careful. Just to move on from that, because I know some people don't like spiders. I'm talking about the beguiling simplicity of reading the saga through the narrated place name and conversely, in an active and perhaps, perhaps even frantic hermeneutic loop, reading the saga narrative back into the modern geography in some kind of self-referential and self-fulfilling sleight of hand. It is so easy to do that, but it is an approach I think we need to understand and avoid. Um, there is no choice. We need to learn to live with spiders and their webs. I would even contend that reading these narratives in such a positive, positivist way ultimately benefits no one, except perhaps those who are still saga positivists. In fact, personally, I tend to take a, I suppose, a slightly hard line on that and think that the positivist approach to landscape reference in sagas is 
bit naive and maybe even anti-intellectual anti -intellectual in some, some ways. Um, but that's not to... Um, I, I still also need to acknowledge that landscapes and place name analysis can function at a number of different levels. But they cannot all be objectively the landscape we're looking at. Um, the presence or absence of recognisable place names is not a question of historical accuracy. Uh, verisimilitude or believable storytelling. For me, neither is the cause for judgment on the abilities of the storyteller. This is a story world. For example, if we look to Caldasinga Saga for a narrative of place, for a grounding of story and geography, what do we make of the absence of Mosfet, which was a politically important farm right under the eastern end of Essia? And if we choose to ignore the really obvious gaps, like Mosfet, then I don't think we can justify focusing on non-gaps for the sake of some kind of search for verisimilitude. I mean, who doesn't want to visit the sites of sagas and read the narratives backwards and forwards and experience the landscape as narrative? I mean, it's what Iceland is built on, but yeah, I need to step away from that a bit. So, to the mechanics of narrated place name semantics, which I promised but haven't got to yet. Um, what I want to do is just have a quick look at some cognitive linguistic stuff, which has, has, has recently turned its mind to place names. Um, Adina Nikolai describes the act of naming as motivated by communicative and referential requirements and identifies in particular the active role of the device of metonymy and meta devices of metonymy and metaphor as critical to the act of naming. Metonymy, as you know, is being part, you know, being where the whole is recognised through reference to a part, metaphor where the reference term has a symbolic relationship to the whole. However, Nik Nikolai favours metonymies over metaphor as lying at the intersection of spatial orientation, language and cognition. She cites Jacob King, 2008, for examples of correlations between physical qualities of watercourses and the linguistic items for their names. Botlov Helleland, in 2012, talked about the sociology of place names, noting the role of place names as references to and symbols of, so that's the metonymy and the metaphor, of acts and experiences. And each of these favour the metonymy generally over metaphor. Um, and metonymous naming practices are uh, fundamental. Uh, basic pragmatic, typically results in what are referred to as transparent place names. Escherberg is of this type. The farm is named for the berg, which is transparent, with which it is transparently associated. And such a format of personal names plus landscape element combined to form a place name is common in Kalmasinga saga and many other sagas. We have Brynjadal, we have Tindastalir, Hakingsdal, Thraundastalir. There's four examples in, from Kalmasinga saga. Um, and it's this pragmatic transparency which is beguiling for um, and because of that because of its, its mere transparent nature I think we need to problematize that practice we mustn't lose sight of the fact we're talking here about names in sagas and these are fundamentally displaced for us they're displaced on at least on two axes um, firstly they're dis displaced through time this is a 15th century text narrating some form of story world reality projected backwards into a, onto a fictive 9th or 10th century Secondly, they are displaced in geographic terms. They exist within a narrative geography, and they are therefore self-consciously constructed in a narrative. Um, they're not consolidated. You know, an alternative would be that they'd be consolidated in a, in a socially negotiated geographic labelling acti activity, such as a map. Um, they only exist in respect of each other in the closed system that is the story map. Um, and thus, conceptually, they are not naturally contiguous with the concrete reference we see when we turn our gaze across the facts of flow and we see Isya, Kalanes, etc. For us to achieve that apparent simple contiguity between the name and the place, we actually go through some rather neat interpretive behaviour. Um, we also do this unknowingly because it's such a natural behaviour for us. Um, the, simplicity, you know, the simplicity of one word in a standing for relationship with another word, with a wider geographic landmark, landmark is so deeply embedded in the way we engage with the, with the world out there that um, we often don't notice what's going on. In terms of semiotics, as I've said, metonymy and metaphor are processes, and they both negotiate the production of meaning through recourse to degrees of contiguity. Um, We have already seen how Essieberg is a metonymic place name. The contiguity between the berg or the cliff and the farm associated with the cliff is transparent. But the question arises now, what happens for someone who is not familiar with the non-narrated geography 
of the Kaplan region. What, what happens to people who are not familiar with this landscape when they're reading the saga? Um, Esjet, to my mind, is in fact the elephant in the room. It's a huge land mass. And it dominates a comparatively narrow coastal strip. But in the story, it's not a mountain. So what are we to make of that? And I think this, this is where I move on to, uh, to metaphor. I think this has to be metaphor that brings a mountain range into the reading, even though we don't have a mountain in the story. The personal name shares an intertextuality with the recognised landscape toponym. Our practice of naming things, the actual fact that we do divide and differentiate an environment with such labels, is fundamentally textual. The name of Esja, here we go, in the saga is thus highly invested and resonates in a strong symbolic relationship with the non-saga content of known geography. That symbolic relationship <coughs> is metaphorical. We know Esja is the mountain, even if we know in the narrative she is not, and vice versa. We know Esja is the per person, even if we know in the landscape she is not. Um, but this is a very problematic situation because such a context is fundamentally reader dependent. How do we problematise our own geographic readings of medieval narrative? Partly we do, just worrying about the time here. Partly we do what the. Oh, I'll skip that bit. Um, six minutes. Oh, good, good, good. <laughs> yes, that's fine. Um, I'll. It's, it's a little parody. Yeah, it's sort of about it's the calling assumption into the questions. We need to treat culture as a semiotic system, um, history discursive, it's contingent, all of that sort of stuff. And I'll move on to the next slide. For the reading of the saga, we need to ask how important is the reader's knowledge of geography? Um, what happens to a reading of a saga for one who hasn't experienced or even thought about the presence of the famous mountain range? Um, what do we make of those readings without the reader possessing the full geographic experience? And are they therefore a, a semiotically impoverished reading? And who is to say what's impoverished and what's not? Um, is it, is it sufficient to add up to constructing a literary spatiality in a narrative like this when that spatiality seems on the face of it to be denying the desire for, for verisimilitude? If, I have, as I've argued, the geography does not, is not in the text, does it even matter? And we move on down to symbolism as the basis for metaphor. It's fundamentally culturally specific. Demands an engagement in shared cultural codes for it to work. The social and cultural dynamics of narrative are fundamentally contextual and fundamentally reader produced. Um, sadly, I don't have an answer to this paradox as to whether knowledge of Esher, the mountain range, is necessary for reading Esher, the character, but I know which perversion I prefer. Um, and, of course, we also have, the, also have the grand opportunity through the interwebs to provide vicarious objectification of the geography, but that doesn't actually solve the problem. Um, I want to turn now something to my last five minutes. It's just five here, so it must be. Um, this page. Um, and here I want to flag a couple of ideas which may or may not be fruitful considering how we might interrogate Esja. I'm also working through this a bit and I hope it doesn't freak you out and please bear with me and all of those caveats. Um, many of us who have studied critical theory in one discipline or another would fam be familiar with the use of late 20th century you know, theories of various kinds, post-structuralism, Marxism, structuralism, philosophy, psychoanalysis, blah, blah, blah as it's applied to text and context. Um, what I want to do here is draw on a fairly recent development in psychoanalytic theory and I hope I can make clear the connection with Kalmasinger saga in the process. I want to talk a bit about Slavo Žižek's reading of Lacan and his own reformulation of the real. Um, I want to do this because it seems to me that Žižek picks up on a potentially fruitful way of exploring the way metaphor comes into play, especially difficult metaphor that is so displaced on a number of levels. Um, and forgive me for mentioning Lacan, and forgive, please forgive me if this is kind of outside your experience. I'm sort of making it up as I go along as well, so we're all in this together. <laughs> uh, the medi medievalist Sarah Kay describes Lacan's um, conception of the real as thus. The real is a combination of what we think of as external reality and the inner reality of our bodily drives. What these have in common is that it cannot be subsumed into language, but on the contrary resisted. She goes on, the real is thus a traumatic residue which infuses speaking subjects with the anxiety that language is not everything. For Zizek's reading of Lacan, this is also a reference back to Sarah Kay's work, the real exists only in contradistinction to reality and it corresponds to the limits and limitations of language. So, the real is a device that conveys the difficult parts that we can't really easily 
contained within the way we, the way we use language. It's about where language fails, conceptually and philosophically. It, re it resists language, and the idea here is that the real is about the language system being fundamentally external to, the su to us as subjects. Um, and therefore, we only have access to what language enables us to articulate. Um, and fair enough if you think this might be a bit silly, and, and I'm okay with that. Um, but it's also slightly difficult, if we're going to go into any of this, it's slightly difficult and perhaps necessarily so, because it is dealing with what the philosophers say are the margins where language really doesn't work properly. Um, but yeah, just ride along with me for a bit and we'll see, here we go. Um, not much more as you can see. Zizek's approach to the real is that it shows up in hints, it, in places in language acts where there are difficulties, contradictions, gaps, absences, uncertainties in the cultural objects, where meanings blur. In short, where we deal with the metaphorical, the symbolic order. So what I want to think about here is an idea for approaching the paradox in this topic. You know, and I think a consideration of Zizek and his febrile and slightly scary mind might be useful. And I'm sorry for leaving you with that picture. Maybe I've got another one I can move on to. No, that's all I'm going to put up with numbers. <laughs> I don't have any conclusions on this, as you can probably guess. I'm not even sure if I know where I'm talking, what I'm talking about. But I think if we're also looking at the role of metaphor in symbolic naming practices, then surely we have to acknowledge that what Zizek and Lacan take as the real is somewhat, or even perhaps highly reminiscent of the way metaphor works, and by offering an indeterminate linguistic and semantic construction that helps bridge that gap. The metaphor offers a highly symbolic positioning of two elements. It demands that the reader constructs his or her own meaning, and the meaning is not foreclosed, and no one meaning is objectively better than another. But where does that meaning come from, and how big a context can any one person be expected to bring with them when they're reading an Icelandic saga or any other text? Um, is it ever really possible to spot the elephant in the room? I mean, especially if the elephant might be in that traumatic and resistant place that is beyond the limits of language. And that's the highly um, loaded question I'll leave you with. And just leave you with one more. Closing the loop for a change, return to one quote from Arnie DeFranco. And thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much, Rodri. Um, yes, we're opening up the floor. Yeah? A quick question. You might have said it and I might have missed it. Do we know what SEO means? Yes. Or you, you, know. <laughs> no, you go. Okay, uh, the, the actual the, the name, it may relate to the Escher, I understand it's Escher in Norway where the stereotype. Um, stone is found. There's also places in um, there's, there's an Mount Asia in the Isle of Lewis from where settlers to colonists may have come from where they may have come but that's all I know. So and it's it Germanic and not Celtic in origin? I wouldn't want to say. I, I'm not sure. Okay. Yeah. I've always thought it was Germanic right enough and there's an Eschenes in Shetland, That's right. yeah, yeah, which yeah. is the highest cliff right up in the northwest corner of Shetland. Yeah. Um, and I translated there as um, headland of the volcanic rock. Mm. So I agree with I you, it's, it's got something to do with the quality of, of or the type mm. of rock. Mm. Yeah. And I think um, Emily Lethbridge at Howie is, is doing some work on, planning to do some work on Escher and the different locations across the north where the name appears. Yeah, but I'm not sure how far that's advanced. And other mini question. Do we do we have do we have do we see it used as a name of people in other examples as far as you know? Uh, I actually don't know. I haven't looked that far into it, no. I've just been looking backwards, not forwards. But that's it she's the only Escher in in the saga corpus. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yes. I think um, I really like the the way of looking at we generate our own means. It doesn't, doesn't make a difference whether you're Icelandic or American or where you're from, but you know, you go to it with your own set of readings. Um, but I wonder if um, whether we whether we think of the sagas as fictional or historical, and think about what they would have been considered after the time of composition as well has a huge impact on that. So obviously the place names that we go that we know about in Iceland that we kind of go to reading sagas with are the modern place names. And when thinking about the time of composition, whether the stories would have existed separately to the place names and moulded to the place names or the place names moulded to the stories. Or, yeah. I, both. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think there is, there is clear, clear evidence that 
some place names have been um, constructed from sagas yeah. rather than the other way around. Uh, I can't recall exactly where and when and which ones, but I've had conversations with people who around this issue. I mean, I'm no sort of saga place name expert. This has just sort of come out of a piece of work I did, which I was slightly intrigued with, so I've never done a survey on this, but I think it's, um, I mean, I'm not going to move into the fiction, you know, um, fact sort of, you know, dichotomous stuff, because I don't think necessarily that our conceptualization of, you know, fictional versus historiography or versus, you know, some form of um, supposed uh, record, even, I mean, I think, I think we have to problematise both versions, even to if we're trying to make sense of the laws, and 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 I don't think we can treat the laws necessarily as an objective source either. You know, there's a whole set of texts there which have their own context of cultural production, and I suppose I'm starting to sound a bit like a Marxist. You can pick, check on this for me if you're Santiago. But in that sense, it's a um, that we need to acknowledge that every every text we have has a has a context which may or may not contain certain aspects of um, you know, what we loosely and, and vaguely refer to as the real world out there, but um, just because we recognise that as real world versus text, it doesn't necessarily mean that the actual relationship in production of those, those narratives is the same. So I didn't really answer your question, it's waffled there. It's interesting to have a discussion, even if we're not answering everything. Yeah, 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 no, no, Anybody else? Um, if there's no other questions or comments, you're welcome now to have your lunch, which is served out in the cafeteria.